This week, a class about efforts in the early 1960s to register African American voters in Mississippi. Professor Carol Anderson of Emory University explains. And remember, so much of the power of the South was predicated on disfranchisement, massive disfranchisement. This is why you have the power of the Southern Democrats in Congress. She also described some of the movement leaders, their tactics, and the opposition they faced from segregationists. So, as you know, on Monday, we ended with the Freedom Rides. And those Freedom Riders were being funneled into Parchman Prison as a way to try to hush them up, to hush them up quietly without the cameras rolling. Because remember, that visual image was absolutely essential for movement, to be able to see the violence of Jim Crow. But that didn't mean that this moment was over. And, and Bobby Kennedy knew it, and Jack Kennedy knew it. So Jack Kennedy is giving his State of the Union address. And President Kennedy is all, we are fighting for democracy and freedom, and there is an opportunity for what is happening here on the globe because we have all of these people. It was the middle of decolonization. Africans, Asians, Arabs, Latinos, those nations are becoming, getting free. Imperial bonds are loosening, and he sees this as an incredible moment for freedom in the global south. But he didn't mention the American South in this freedom struggle. A kind of silence there. But he needed that silence because what he was dealing with, he had just come back from that Vienna summit Remember the one that his, his brother was really trying to get the Freedom Riders to like quiet out on? And well, that Vienna summit didn't go so well. He met with Khrushchev, and Khrushchev took him to school. I mean, ooh, in that land of, oh, this wasn't pretty. <laughs> it really wasn't pretty. And, and it was Kennedy's fault. He acknowledged that later on. He thought that what he could do because he's gotten by on charm, is he could just walk in there and charm, you know, one of those charm fellows, charm Nikita Khrushchev. Khrushchev who has been in the war, Khrushchev who has survived Joseph Stalin. I love Ariana's face right there. She's like, yeah, survive that. (laughs) So he thinks that he can just charm him. So he wasn't prepared. So imagine going into a summit meeting with the head of the Soviet Union. And you haven't done your homework. (laughs) Have you ever walked in to, okay, I'm seeing the heads already (laughs) nod. (laughs) And he just wasn't ready. And afterwards, he told uh, a New York Times reporter, Khrushchev beat the hell out of me. Mm. Yeah. Because there was the Bay of Pigs, that debacle where the U.S. had tried to invade Cuba um, after Fidel Castro had taken over the island, knocked out Batista. And the Bay of Pigs mm, went about as well as the Vienna Summit. So he's got stuff on him. And so he's trying to figure out, how do I begin to rethink, re-talk about, re- re-establish authority, re-establish democracy, re-establish strength as emanating out of the U.S. after I've had the Bay of Pigs and Vienna? Well, there was a problem with that wanting to re-establish was because you also had the South blowing up. Black folks struggling to be free and refusing to be quiet about Jim Crow and the brutality of Jim Crow. So Bobby's got to figure out something. And what Bobby figures out 
is like, I've got to find a way to find the sweet spot. That thing that allows my brother to be presidential, for America to be calm, to resonate that aura of strength, democracy, and freedom, while also providing something to the civil rights folks so that they feel that they are being heard and their needs are being met. What on earth could there be? What could I do, offer them that is so hmm, vital and essential, but boring, really boring, so that no cameras will want to be there, that nothing's going to jump off. And you know what he came up with? Registering black folks to vote in Mississippi. (laughs) Okay, so let's talk about that. (laughs) So this is where you know you've got this kind of disjuncture between policymakers and what they think is happening and what is really going on on the ground. Because if you had really spent a minute thinking through it, you're saying, wait a minute, if I'm seeing folks getting burned up because they're trying to ride a bus, I mean, just ride a bus, then what am I going to see happening when they're trying to vote or even register to vote? And remember, so much of the power of the South was predicated on disfranchisement, massive disfranchisement. This is why you have the power of the Southern Democrats in Congress, because they're getting elected over and over and over and moving up the ranks in terms of seniority, because they only have to be responsive to a small band of the electorate in the South. And so you're pretty much almost assured of getting it reelected and reelected and reelected and reelected and reelected and reelected and reelected, <laughs> right? And so that kind of power, I'm not going to give it up easily. But he's thinking, okay, we've got this. We've got this. And so he sets up an arrangement where the, the IRS is going to, to fund a new organization, provide tax-exempt status for a new organization dealing with, with voting rights. And he's going to try to funnel four of the big civil rights organizations under the heading of this organization. This would be the Voter Education Project. And it sounds brilliant on paper. Because, again, what it's designed to do is to provide something that the civil rights workers want. While apparently being boring enough because you're just registering folks to vote. And, you know, and you've got this image. Think about registering folks to vote. There's a table. There's some registration cards, Right? If you think about it the way we think about it now, or not quite right now, (laughs) but you just do it. But remember, this is Mississippi. Remember, we have the poll tax. We have the literacy test. We have the understanding clause. We've got election day terrorism. We have the power sitting there to, in fact, reinforce massive disfranchisement. And so just registering folks to vote is not going to be that easy. But this is the name of the organization. The Council of Federated Organizations. And what he's going to do, and it's going to be tricky... He's going to try to bring SCLC, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and the NAACP together. 
Now, there's already a bit of, um, because the NAACP, big dog. We've been here since 1909, right? And, 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 you know, and Roy Wilkins had been with the NAACP since the early 1930s. And he (laughs) waited his time, did his work, moved his way up the organizational ladder, and finally in 1955 became the head of the NAACP. What else happened in 1955? Emmett Till? Emmett Till? <clears throat> Rosa, Parks. Rosa Parks, the Montgomery bus boycott. Who was heading up the Montgomery Improvement Association? Martin Luther King. King. Martin Luther King. So imagine you've waited 20 some years to be head of the civil rights movement leadership. And within the moment, the year that you become the head. There comes this guy out of Montgomery, Alabama, that all of a sudden the media is flocking all around, talking about, ooh, the leader, the leader. So there was this kind of uh, rivalry there. Wilkins would help King out of numerous jams. Don't get me wrong. But we also have to take into account when we're talking about alliances, we're also talking about the kind of real deal stuff about people and organizations working together and the frictions that happen when you're dealing with people who believe that they should be here and somebody else is getting something that they should have. So Kennedy was also going to have to try to work through this relationship between SCLC and the NAACP. But what he really wanted was to defuse the power of the student shock troops coming out of SNCC and CORE. Because students are fearless. And you think about that moment after that beating at the bus station and it looked like the freedom rides were over and CORE is just like, And Diane Nash out of SNCC's like, we got this. Let's send some more students down. You don't stop us simply because you're going to beat somebody. We're stronger than that. Democracy is stronger than that. And the students kept coming. Kennedy's looking up going, okay, so we've got them in Parchment Prison right now, but that's only a stopgap measure. There are more students in Parchment can even hold (laughs) And we have got to figure out how to diffuse the power and the energy of these students. So something happened that was going to help with that conversation. And that something was members of SCLC and SNCC met with Bobby Kennedy at the Department of Justice. Because remember, he's the attorney general. And they are demanding protection from the federal government for freedom riders. And protection does not mean shepherding them into Parchman Prison. This means real protection. And they are, you know, they're on it. And he's coming back. And they're, and he's, <laughs> and, and, and what they're dealing with here, you know, so finally he's like, look, and you know, when you get look, and he's like, look, freedom rides aren't working, not working. Am I clear? But there's something that will work. You want real civil rights, you want real freedom, you want real protection, that comes from the vote. Let me see you fight for the vote. We're going to help you fight for the vote. We have this wonderful organization that we've just created, the Council of Federated Organizations. And we are going to help you in terms of providing protection and resources for you to go into Mississippi and register black folks to vote. What do you think? It's like, well, you you didn't answer that quite the way I was hoping you'd answer, so let me help you with that. 
you know we've got this war going on. Mm. Right now you have deferments. I'll see to it that you keep your deferments. You go to Mississippi. You don't go to Mississippi, you're going to Vietnam. Now, I want you to think about that as 18, 19 year olds right now. I'm just assuming all of y'all about 18, 19. You're like, the 29 year olds going, yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> Vietnam, Mississippi. Which one are you choosing? Vietnam? Vietnam. Wait, to be, Mississippi. To be honest, though, it ain't really good in Mississippi either. <laughs> like, yeah, right? <laughs> Vietnam? <laughs> Did you hear? She said, to be honest, though, it ain't really good in Mississippi either. <laughs> so this is what you're choosing between Vietnam and Mississippi. So then you're having to make another choice. Where do I think I can do the most good? And that's the parameter. Where do I think I can be the change agent? They chose Mississippi. While the, yes. They, Did anyone choose Vietnam? Yeah, not that I know of. <laughs> um, not that I know of. That's not to say it didn't happen. But, uh, While this debate is going on, there's a SNCC member up in Massachusetts, Harvard-trained philosopher, Bob Moses. And Moses had uh, an aura status in SNCC because he had what I call quiet power. You know that thing where, you know, it's not the one who's blustering the most, it's not the one who's hollering the most, it's not the one who's the flashiest, but there's just... Something. Yeah. Quiet power. And Moses had, Chad's like, yeah, I got quiet power. <laughs> and Moses, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> and, and so Moses had that. And Moses had been asked by the head of the NAACP down in Macomb, Mississippi, to come down to Mississippi and help register folks to vote. So even separate from what's called COFO, right? Separate from the Bobby Kennedy organization, Moses is on his way down. And he gets to Macomb, Mississippi with about 12,000 residents and only 250 African-Americans registered to vote. Yes. Like volunteering, or is he like on? Okay. He's volunteering. Okay. That's Moses. And this is a man who will be appropriately named. Yeah. He, he went down to Macomb, Mississippi, and began setting up civic education classes. Because, and, and, because one of the things, remember, when we're talking about, like, the schools. Remember, we're talking about the textbooks in the schools. And in these Jim Crow schools... The textbooks for black children did not mention that there was a 13th Amendment, a 14th Amendment, or a 15th Amendment. And so if what you're reading is what you know, then you don't have a full sense that slavery has been abolished, that you have equal protection under the law with due process and birthright citizenship and the right to vote. So when you begin to set up these civic education classes, it begins to help the folks understand they're not just Mississippi citizens. They're citizens of the United States of America with a whole range of rights that the state of Mississippi has not yet fully acknowledged for African Americans. And, you know, it's one of those things. Once you begin to, to see, it's like your, your vistas just widen up. And you're thinking, ooh, whoa, wow. Then he sets up registration classes. 
What is it going to take to get through a literacy test? Because again, remember, about half of black adults in Mississippi have five or fewer years of formal education, a formal Jim Crow education. So being able to read a constitution and then interpret it, like you've got a Harvard JD and there was Moses sitting down with the folk, working them through how do you get through the literacy exams? Yeah, you're beginning to see the power of this thing, yeah? Emory. So we use it like in church or because if it's if Mississippi and a lot of these, I'm, I'm made to understand a lot of these people were working class. Were these like night courses, morning courses, lunch courses? Or- he, he was going whenever and wherever. You know, and that's one of the things about movement building is that you go where the people are. You go when they are, you go where they are. And so with all of these courses and and literacy tests and and helping folks with these civic education classes and voter registration classes, he begins to try to register black folk to vote. Hmm. There was a young man down in Mississippi named Hollis Watkins. And Hollis is noticing the work that Moses is doing. Hollis is impressed. He's about 17 at the time. He's like, look at this guy coming down here from Harvard, doing this work. And then he says to Moses, but you know, if you really want to be about it, Macomb is easy. Where you really need to go is to Amity and Walthall counties. Because there's about one black person registered to vote between the two counties. And what Moses knew was that if he took the easy route, and understand when I'm saying easy, I've got that in like big quotes. (laughs) He knew that in order to fully gain the trust Because movement building is also about trust. In order to gain the trust of black Mississippians, he was was going to have to go where they live. So he went into Amity County. Yeah, it it got almost like quiet in here. You almost hear like dun dun. He started doing the civic education classes, started doing the voter education classes, and then he went to go register some folks to vote. He got arrested. Now, think about that. You just got arrested for registering American citizens to vote. But he knows that he has the protection now of the federal government. So he calls John Doerr, who is an assistant in Bobby Kennedy's office. And he calls John Doerr with that one phone call that he gets. And he calls John Doerr and he's like, I need you to know I have just been arrested for registering black people to vote. I believe that's what that federal protection is all about. And John Doerr is like, I thank you so much for conveying that information. (laughs) Two days later, the NAACP bails Bob Moses out of jail. Moses goes back. He continues to work with the people. Then he finds another group and they go to register to vote. Now, part of the problem is that where Moses had been staying was right across the street from State Representative E.H. Hurst. E.H. Hurst was a segregationist white supremacist of the first magnitude. 
And Moses was staying right across the street from him. But even worse than E.H. Hurston, and that's bad, was his son-in-law, Billy Jack Caston. Billy Jack had terrorized black people as long as Billy Jack could terrorize black people. And he saw what Moses was doing. And you begin to think how this threatens the power structure. When you have counties that are 50% black, but you've only got like one registered voter there. If you can get all of them registered and voting, all of a sudden you have different officials, which means you're getting different policies, which means, oh, I don't know, maybe E.H. Hurst isn't going to be a state representative for too long. This is really going after a segregationist white supremacist power structure. Yeah. So he was like, yeah. <laughs> so Moses goes down to the courthouse. He's got a couple of guys with him. They're going up the steps to go register black folk to vote. And Billy Jack Caston shows up, pulls out a knife, turns the handle around, and bam! Hits Moses. Moses staggers. Billy Jack's not done. He starts wailing on him, wailing on him. And remember nonviolence is that you learn how to take the blows. Because what you know, remember we've talked about these ethnic notions. What you know is that the moment you swing back becomes justifiable homicide when they kill you. Multiple reasons for nonviolence as a strategy. And so wailing on him, wailing on him. And Moses just goes into his zone. That, that kind of Zen zone, that kind of. Mm. The two black guys who were with him, who were, he was going to help register to vote. They saw Billy Jack and they took off running. So it is. Just, yeah. Yeah. You know, when your boys up, just up and leave you. <laughs> it's like, Whoa. <laughs> Um, and so when Billy Jack is done, I mean, Moses is a bloody, pulpy mess. Billy Jack's really proud of what he's done. He and his boys walk away like, <laughs> when they're gone, Moses stands up, bleeding, just bleeding. The two guys who had run away, they're like looking and Moses is like, you ready to go register to vote? Yeah. I mean, you see that kind of strength. That's that quiet power leading. He calls John Doerr. They couldn't register, that, as I recall. They, he calls John Doerr when he gets back to the house across from E.H. Hurst going, um, I want to report to you a, a beating. I was beaten. And Dor says, yes, I know. He's like, you know? He's like, yes, I know. Um, I've already got the FBI report here, but I'll come down and I'll see uh, what I can do, see what's going on. Well, J. Edgar Hoover was the head of the FBI. J. Edgar Hoover was not, um, mm, how does one say? <laughs> He was so not feeling the civil rights movement, civil rights leaders, civil rights goal, civil rights, civil, civil, no. <laughs> That's J. Edgar. You know, as far as he was concerned, they were communist. Just communist. And so when Dorr has this FBI report that says, eh, he then gets down to Mississippi and he sees Moses, <coughs> bruised. That's not what the FBI report said. What Dor was expecting were, it was maybe a, a, a bruise here. He wasn't expecting what he saw. And he stepped back. And he thought, this has got, I, I got to begin to kind of rethink the, the FBI's commitment <laughs> To civil rights protection here, because uh, 
what this report is saying is not what the evidence is. And so what Moses tells him, he's like, yeah, I'll be all right. I just wanted you to know the depth of the violence. And the depth of the violence is going to get worse because there is a man who has been helping me named Herbert Lee. And Herbert has been driving around, driving me from place to place, from house to house. Anybody live out in the country? Own it. <laughs> yes, okay. And you know, houses, houses aren't like they are in the city where they just like ride up against each other and you can look right in the window and you can see what your neighbor's fixing for dinner. Right? <laughs> you know, right? It's not like that. I mean, you've got acres between these homes. And so walking them is not always the most efficient way if you're trying to get something done. So Herbert Lee was driving Moses to these homes, helping folk with civic, class, civic education classes. Remember, Moses is living right across the street from E.H. Hurst. E.H. Hurst sees what's happening. E.H. Hurst sees Herbert Lee facilitating voter registration in Mississippi. Moses tells Dorr, protect Herbert Lee. I fear for his life. Protect him. Protect him. Protect him. Dorr says, okay. Will do. Gets on the plane, flies back to D.C. to protect him, you know, work on some stuff. The moment he gets there, he sees the notice. Herbert Lee has been found shot to death. E.H. Hurst shot him. State Representative E.H. Hurst shot him. Hurst claimed that, how do you say this? It was self-defense. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk you through this like we walk through Scottsboro. So Herbert Lee drove up in his truck got out of his truck with a tire iron, swinging it at Mississippi State Representative E.H. Hurst. Now, all who believe that story, please raise your hand. <laughs> what, are you saying it lacks credibility? <laughs> it does. But he had witnesses. Son-in-law? <laughs> You're like, oh, yeah, the son-in-law. <laughs> and a black man. Timothy, that looked like, what? <laughs> Named Lewis Allen. Who said, yeah, it happened just the way Representative Hurst said it happened. He got out of the truck, swinging a tire iron at him, and, and, and so Representative Hearst had to protect himself, and so he shot him. Bob Moses is listening to this and is going, you know what, that's not adding up. That's really not adding up. Let's see what we can do here. And so he begins to talk to Lewis Allen. He's going, is that how it really happened? Yes. No, really. Is that how it really happened? Yes. Is that how it really happened? No. <laughs> <laughs> and Lewis Allen was afraid, afraid for his life. So he would leave Mississippi. But before he left, he promised Bob Moses he would come back and tell the truth. And the truth was that Herbert Lee drove up the moment he got out of his truck. E.H. Hurst shot him, then took a tire iron and planted it under his body. Lewis Allen would come back to Mississippi because he missed Mississippi. His business was in Mississippi. He was in lumbering, right? Lumber. And he would come back and then... <clears throat> Mm. 
Lewis Allen suffered three shotgun blasts to the face on his last trip back to Mississippi. Bob Moses took that death on his shoulders and in his heart and in his soul. Because he's like, Lewis Allen, if I hadn't talked to him, if I hadn't convinced him to tell the truth, that man would still be alive. But one of the things that became really clear to him, what became really clear to him was that it was going to take more than what SNCC had been able to do to bring voting rights to Mississippi. It was going to take more than this structure of of COFO, Council of Federated Organizations, because there are bodies piling up and nothing is moving, nothing is changing. How do you create change? What Moses comes up with is Freedom Summer. And Freedom Summer will be that moment where he's saying we have to bring in students Because, you know, y'all fearless. (laughs) Students from around the nation to come to Mississippi, set up freedom schools, and register folks to vote. Now, the people that he's bringing in, black students and white students, And not just white students, white students from the Ivies, whose fathers and mothers are judges and senators. You begin to think through strategy. He thought even Mississippi is not crazy enough to do damage to these students and we can get some work done here in changing the power structure. Any questions? Okay. Wow, really? Mm -hmm. Emery. How how are the finances looking so like? How are they going to sustain all these volunteers and all the... I'm, I'm there is, <laughs> he's asking about finances. And so fundraising for the movement is always precarious. And so this is where you have one, you have celebrities like Harry Belafonte fully engaged in, in fundraising. You have um, a man named Stanley Levinson that... J. Edgar Hoover was convinced was a communist. And, and, and Levinson worked hand in hand with Martin Luther King in fundraising, particularly up north. There um, is a wonderful article, Who Funded King? And it talks about that fundraising effort because money is always tight. Yeah. Mark. So you said that the, the, the sentiment was that even Mississippi wasn't crazy enough to damage the students that they were bringing in, but every time we seem to say that in this course, it seems like Mississippi is crazy enough, so. <laughs> <laughs> what, are you wanting a spoiler alert? Is this what I'm hearing here? Oh, I'm just skeptical. Isn't You're it? skeptical. That's going to be next week's lecture. Yes, Emily. Um, did E.H. Chris ever like face repercussions, or did he just kind of walk away scot free? You... That's what I said. <laughs> he walked. Yeah. The, remember, you know, and so remember, this is the, what, what we've been dealing with is the 
the lack of value on black life. The black life has no value. And, and so gunning down a black man who's trying to help register people to vote has no value. Josh. Um, I was wondering how um, Bob Moses attracted uh, white students from the North and other places with a substantial background. Um, you know, he's, he's out of Harvard. He's brilliant. He's got that quiet power charisma. And this is a moment in the 60s where students believe that they can make a real difference where they can change the course of this nation's history. And they're ready to do that work. You know, so you take that sense of fearlessness and you mix it with that kind of visionary zeal and a cause. Yeah, they flocked down to Mississippi. And again, yeah. Yeah, Freedom Summer is going to be something. Yes, Nate. Um, Going back a little bit, did... um was J. Edgar Hoover ever, like, confronted about the falsified FBI report? Like, what happened with that? Like, yes, I, I'm, aware. I'm aware. But in this specific case, did anything happen? J. Edgar Hoover was interesting. Was, was that good? Was that good? Um, okay, so with J. Edgar Hoover, um, Kennedy did not like Hoover. Period. I mean, you wanted him gone. There was a meeting that Hoover had with Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, one-on-one, just those two. After that meeting, the you are hereby fired notice was rescinded. Hoover really didn't face the consequences of a lot of the bad stuff that he did. And he was in power until 72. So I'm looking back at Steve. Um, Early 70s, he died somewhere in the middle of Watergate. But he came into power around 1920. Right, right. So he came into power during the first Red Scare. You know, so right around the end of the First World War and died during Watergate. Somewhere in that era. Yes. He put his stamp on that organization. Daniel. Um, If you're able to, can you tell us more about what actually happened in that meeting? And um, (laughs) (laughs) were there any other attempts on behalf of the Kennedy administration to undermine the work that Hoover was doing? Okay, so the rumors have it that um, Kennedy liked women. (laughs) A lot. And that there was evidence about how much. That's a rumor. So, no, because there was nobody else in that meeting. It's really hard to tell. And it appears that, again, rumor, that one of the women that he liked a lot... (laughs) 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 What you get? This is a G-rated show here, people. <laughs> um, may have been compromised in terms of being a spy. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's why you just stay faithful. That's a move. <laughs> I mean, did you, did you, Emory just said, why didn't he just stay faithful? Every last one of y'all in here remember that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So, I mean, but again, these are rumors. These are these, these little pieces that folks are trying to put together. But what you know is that he could not stand Hoover. And Bobby Kennedy really couldn't stand him. And Bobby Kennedy is actually Hoover's boss. Because Bobby Kennedy is the attorney general. And those two clashed. Bobby wanted him gone. After that meeting, Hoover stayed. 
Yeah. Sabine. You said that the voter education project was um, like some of Kennedy's reasoning behind that specific thing was that it would have less press coverage and therefore kind of like on the down low be helping um, the civil rights movement, but without too much press. Mm -hmm. Did there end up, what was the media coverage like because there ended up being violence? The media coverage was not as high profile at this moment, but it would be during Freedom Summer. <laughs> yes. Yes. So when we get to Freedom Summer, the press is going to really come in because the killings are going to be horrific. Yeah. Joshua. I was wondering, um, during the voter education, and I guess uh, more into the Freedom Summer, like how did local Mississippians uh, respond and overcome like, terrorism and their fears of this to work with folks like Bob Moses? So you had, um, it's a great question. So when you say, so you mean, how did African Americans in Mississippi? Yeah, yeah, especially if we see like Lewis Allen and like Herbert Lee. Fannie Lou Hamer out of Mississippi. Been reading, right? Yes, okay, good. Um, Fannie Lou Hamer says, when you get sick and tired of being sick and tired, you know, there comes that moment where you're just not going to take it. So not everybody stood up. But you had enough folks in Mississippi. You had like Vera Piggy down in Clarksdale, Mississippi, who was using her independent business. She was a, a hairdresser. She was using that as the spot where people were organizing. And because she did black women's hair and she owned her shop, she wasn't dependent upon anyone else for her financial well-being. That economic independence allowed her. Now, it wasn't like she didn't get harassed and her daughter didn't get harassed. But she was just, phew. Yeah, so you had folks who just were sick and tired of being sick and tired and were ready to put it on the line for a better future. And, I, and, and when you think about it, that's what we keep talking about in the movement. We don't have everybody standing up. But we have enough people standing up. Okay, thank you. Oh, yes, Alex. What was Bobby Kennedy up to while the voter education project just wasn't happening in Mississippi? That's a great question. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> except I know that they weren't getting the protection that Bobby had promised. And that lack of protection that he had promised was then sending Moses into a direction that Bobby really didn't think this thing was going to go. So, backfire. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Don't you dare. <laughs> Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in learning more about the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Bill of 1965, then you should check out our Presidential Recordings podcast. The entire first season, focusing on the presidency of President Lyndon Johnson, is available now. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts.